Hey everyone, I'm your host Anthony. We do content like this weekly, so hit the subscribe button and ring the bell to get notified. If you want more content like this, click the like button and please leave a comment. Thanks again for watching. Let's get going. So hello everyone and welcome to our live class. We're very excited to have you here and looking forward to a great lecture today. My name is Anthony. I'll be your host for today. I'm joined on the line by Dr. Watkins, Chief Medical Officer of Sinesco and Nathan Bridges, a Clinical Support Manager. We'll be conducting most of the presentation today. I will pass it off to them momentarily to kick off today's presentation topic, HPA Axis Dysfunction 101, an introduction. But before we get started, I'd like to go over just a few housekeeping items. I've muted everyone by default. And secondly, if you have any questions during the course of this live class, please submit them in the chat panel. The questions will all come to me as the host, and I will be conducting a live Q&A with our presenter at the end of today's presentation. With that said, I'd like to pass it off to Dr. Watkins to start the presentation. Thank you so much, Anthony. I really appreciate it. And deeply appreciate everybody's time. I know um, as practitioners, we uh, can get pretty pretty busy schedule. So you taking time out of your schedule to join us uh, means an awful lot. And I, and I hope you find it valuable today. So um, again, I'm uh, Chip Watkins and I'm Chief Medical Officer of Sinesco and uh, President and Laboratory Director of Neurolab. We're very big on names at uh, Sinesco. Uh, and then my partner in crime today is uh, Nathan Bridges. He's our Clinical Support Manager. And so we look forward to, uh, to, to taking you guys through this. Um, HPA axis um, function and dysfunction. Um, I guess so. But I, you know, I, I really think when I think about the HPA axis, I, I kind of kind of think about it as being the money shot, if you will, um, uh, in terms of helping folks feel better and and, and get better. I mean, it's absolutely um, essential to good health and and achieving balance in that HPA uh, TG axis. Uh, I think we'll do more for your patients um, than just about any other area you want to talk about. Um, so yeah, this is me and um, I've been around for quite a while. <laughs> and uh, now I guess I have over 30 years in private practice. I've been in solo practice and three man practice and six man practice. Um, I've done teaching uh, for a few years and then um, also corporate medicine. Um, having been a uh, medical director at uh, Great Smokies, now Genova Diagnostics here in Nashville. Um, so that's moi. And then here are Nathan's credentials. You guys can, can look over that, but he is an overall great guy. Um, and you'll be hearing from Nathan a little bit later on in the presentation. He'll take us through a couple of case studies and so forth. I wanted to, to share with you guys our, our vision statement and our mission statement just real briefly. Um, and you can see kind of through looking at that, that we are really kind of all about the personalized medicine. And it's what our patients are looking for. Um, you know, something that's just very individualized, something very specific to them. Um, and I think as we move down the road further uh, toward genomic medicine and proteomics and metabolomics and those sort of things, things will get, you know, even more um, personalized. So who is Sinesco? Um, we think of ourselves as a medical company uh, and, and Sinesco is kind of the umbrella uh, company. Uh, we're, we're not really a lab. We're not really a supplement company, but consider ourselves again a a medical company uh, really specializing in personalized medicine um, to you, our customer. Um, so our providers really are our customers. We have no direct to consumer type stuff and um, you have to be a practitioner to get the supplements and those sort of things. We, you know, so we keep all that pretty clean, I think. Um, our, our newest division there, as you can see, a uh, community lab. A community lab was actually uh, developed to address the COVID uh, situation. And we run a number of different tests on a number of different platforms, um, giving our regional providers um, uh, lots of options for testing on their population. Um, and, and I think, you know, as time goes on, that community lab will continue to evolve. And we're, you know, talking about doing more specialized um, sort of testing, more of a um, specialized lab as we move through time. 
Oops, why did I do that? All right, so um, under that umbrella of Sinesco is NeuroLab, and this is uh, really our, our lab portion where we do research analysis and develop um, actually uh, biomarkers. Um, NeuroLab is both CLIA and COLA certified. Um, and for, for what it's worth, I um, am on the board of directors of COLA as an American Academy of Family Physicians appointee. So, you know, from a regulatory standpoint, we certainly keep on top of all of that stuff. Um, and in addition to that side of the business, we also participate in a number of voluntary um, third-party quality assurance um, testing companies. So uh, like AAFP proficiency testing and, and BioRad, which I think is probably one of the um, leading quality assurance labs in the, in the world, actually. And we participate with them by sending blinded samples to them every month. Um, they run those samples on their PC, um, HPLC machines compared to what we did. And we have to stay within a certain, you know, parameters and a percentage uh, in order to keep our certifications with them. Uh, and that is nothing that is required of us. COLA and Orclea um, has that as a mandate. Um, it's something we do voluntarily. And I think um, it probably sets us apart. Uh, from a lot of labs in this business. And, and trust me, I had no idea um, as a practicing family doc, um, you know, what uh, lab medicine was really all about until I, until I started doing this about 12 years ago. Um, but I, I can just tell you in the integrative uh, and functional medicine space, um, there's just a lot of homegrown stuff. Uh, again, not to diss anybody, but um, for, for instance, a lot of labs in this space um, do homegrown controls, make their own controls and that sort of thing. So we get our controls from Fisher Scientific. Um, so I could, I could go on and on about that, but um, suffice to say, I hope uh, that gives you guys a little bit more confidence in um, our lab and and that the number that we give you is the number. Again, that's not to say that things can happen in terms of collection or something to happen in transit, but we have a lot of confidence um, about the numbers that we give to you all. Um, so in terms of the biomarkers that we analyze, uh, our urinary neurotransmitters, serotonin, GABA are on the inhibitory side. Uh, <clears throat> hope to be adding glycine, hopefully in the not too distant future. And then we've got you know, our catecholamines um, and glutamate and PEA that are really excitatory neurotransmitters. Dopamine kind of swings both ways, if you will. <laughs> um, and then we do salivary adrenal hormone testing with a four-point cortisol and a two-point DHEA. That is an FDA-approved kit, again, uh, just in terms of quality. Um, and then we do sex hormone testing. Um, not, I guess, really here to talk about, um, uh, you know, uh, why one is better than another. I think that's a, a personal decision that everybody has to come to. I think there's probably validity to lots of different ways to do things. Um, maybe there's no one real best way. I mean, for most of my career, I, I've been a serum guy. Um, and then kind of learning about um, uh, salivary sex hormones um, came to realize that if I've got my patients, particularly on transdermal, hormones uh, and I'm doing serum, I'm, it's, maybe it's not malpractice, but it's it may be pretty close because I'm probably overdosing. Um, anywho, uh, it may be topics for another day. But um, so we use really um, top of the line gold standard technology with our uh, ultra high pressure liquid chromatography and the um, triple quad, quadrupole mass spec. Uh, this is a, you can see the machine there. It's, it's, Pretty much brand new. We're still paying for it, um, but it, it really is. This machine gives us the highest sensitivity and specificity for for neurotransmitters, and really the most accurate and reproducible results. Every run that we do is accompanied by a control. <clears throat> um, so, if you all are, are doing our tests and you have a question, you know one of one of your lab values looks wonky or a little bit out of whack call us uh, and we can look at the um, run before and the run after the sample in question. Um, and so we can at least tell you from the lab side if everything looks okay there. I, again, uh, things can happen in transit or collection or a lot of things that, you know, we don't have control over, but um, we can 
we can help you feel good about the numbers. And yeah, so in terms of what we're gonna be talking about today, um, maybe who should be tested and why neurotransmitters and, and cortisol need to be tested. Um, a little bit about the validity of urinary neurotransmitters. Um, and then Nathan's gonna share with you some of the benefits of our, what we call our care package add-on. And um, we hope that you'll decide to kind of go down that road and at least uh, at least investigate that and take a look at it. I think there are some, some value adds with the practices there. And then we'll do um, a couple of case studies. And if that sounds okay, um, we'll go ahead. So who should be tested? Well, clearly everybody all the time. Uh, just kidding. But uh, I will tell you that um, this type of testing really has just become a part of my new patient workup. I mean, I, I just think it's that important. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a good piece of the puzzle. It's not the answer. I don't want to oversell things, but I mean, I do think it is a, it's an important piece of the puzzle and it's really helpful to be able to sit across from a patient and share this, you know, on, on paper in black and white. And I can't tell you the number of patients that have actually um, looked me in the eye and actually with a tear said, why hasn't my doctor ever done this test before? I mean, this is so helpful. It really helps me understand why I feel or why I felt the way I felt all these years. So um, yeah, it's just become a, 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 a really big part of the answer, I think. And so, um, you know, kind of the low hanging fruit um, are, are some of the things that walk through the, the door. You can look at this list here and I don't know about your practice, but in my practice, it's probably 85% of the stuff that walks through the door right there. Um, and, and I would say, you know, in functional medicine and, and with this test, kind of our bread and butter uh, is, is really, you know, perimenopausal women, menopausal women, andropausal men, um, you know, mild to moderate anxiety, mild to moderate depression, uh, sleep issues and fatigue are probably by far, you know, the, the most important or the most common things that we see. And kind of, why is this moving? Anthony, yeah. Okay. Am I, am I still on? Could you just give me a thumbs up or a, yeah, you're still on. Hey, everyone. Chip, yes. Uh, Dr. Watkins, yes, you are still on currently. And just a yes. quick reminder if you can speak a little bit more into the microphone, I think we're having just a little bit of audio. Uh, correction right now. It's just going a little bit in and out. So Warren, that you are All right. Is that better? Should be better. Yeah. I think if you speak just okay. a little bit more to the microphone, that should limit some of the in and out. So I'll lean forward. <laughs> right. Thank you so much. You bet. Thanks. Um, and so uh, with anxiety, uh, you know, here's a uh, graphic down there and uh, on the left looking at pre-pandemic and uh, and then February of last year. Uh, how many of you know this has been a hard year? These last 18 months have been difficult. Um, and again, as you look here to the right, you know, common frequency of, of symptoms, um, anxiousness, headache, uh, low mood, fatigue, uh, all of those things. And, and the pandemic has just really uh, really made those things much, much worse. Um, so then why test neurotransmitters and adrenal hormones? Um, uh, well, again, uh, this is probably 85%, at least in, in, in my practice, but 85% of the stuff that walks through the door. Um, and again, which is why I kind of call the HPA axis function and dysfunction and, and balancing that out and returning those folks to normal, really, really the money shot and getting people to feel better. I mean, you take care of neurotransmitters and their thyroid and their sex hormone balance um, and adrenal function, you're going to have some happy patients, you know? All right. And so this um, slide should be pretty familiar, familiar to everybody, uh, but it's still good to have kind of a 30,000 foot view of what's going on here. Right. So a stress comes in, uh, right. And knocks the hypothalamus and um, CRH gets released uh, from the hypothalamus, goes down to the anterior, uh, anterior pituitary and the pituitary releases ACTH 
uh, which then goes on to activate the adrenal cortex to release cortisol and DHEA and to uh, activate the adrenal medulla in terms of the um, cort uh, catecholamines, right? And then we have this nice kind of negative feedback loop that then shuts down cortisol and CRH um, as that negative uh, or negative uh, feedback uh, kind of kicks in there. So that's kind of the, again, 30,000 foot view there. Um, and so this is a, a slide uh, kind of about some of these neurotransmitter uh, and hormonal interactions. And to me, this is, is really kind of some of the fun stuff where you really are, are able to figure out what's going on with the patient. So, you know, particularly with acute stress, we see um, cortisol DHEA, go up as well as our um, catecholamines, norepi and epi. We see that um, actually elevated DHEA will suppress GABA function and, and actually potential, potentiate um, glutamate. Um, and then elevated cortisol tends to suppress serotonin probably about four different ways. Um, and one way that that happens is uh, with high cortisol, um, the production of, of serotonin gets actually shunted down the chiorinin pathway. And so you're seeing a lot more inflammation in that instance as well. Um, and then over the long haul, and we've all seen this, you know, changes uh, in, in cortisol and DHEA can actually go lower over time as people begin to experience um, adrenal fatigue, if you will. Uh, and then norepinephrine can also um, get desensitized over time. So um, remember too that cortisol is needed to convert norepi to epi. Actually, that takes two things. To convert norepinephrine to epinephrine, you need cortisol and you need SAMe, you need methylators, right? So, um, and then we know that DHEA actually um, positively increases um, dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. So kind of some of the interactions there, just a real brief uh, overview there. Uh, what inter what uh, activates the, the stress response? I, I don't know how many of you ever read um, Sapolsky's um, Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. It's a great read. Um, but, you know, one of the big differences between us and the, if you will, lower animals uh, is that, you know, if there are zebras on, around a watering hole and there's a, a lion there uh, and the lion, you know, everybody's stressed out, right? Um, and the lion picks out their young or old or lame uh, antelope or, or, or whatever and takes off after it and then is eating that antelope. Same lions, same zebra around the same watering hole, stress levels go down completely because the animals know that the stress is over. The stressor is gone, right? Us with our big cerebrums um, have this idea of perceived stress. Um, and we perseverate, right? Something goes wrong or the messages we tell ourselves and over and over and over again. And we just, it's, it's perceived stress rather than a real stress that can um, bother humans just because of our, like I say, our larger cerebrums and, and, and thinking capacity. Um, poor sleep, uh, you know, we have a, we're a, we're a nation of, of poor sleepers. Um, we just don't get enough sleep or uh, enough quality sleep. You know, inflammation uh, certainly can become really a vicious cycle. Uh, and, you know, really the top of the uh, inflammation cascade is really norepinephrine as it affects uh, NF-kappa B. And that, that whole inflammatory, inflammatory cas cascade happens. And so uh, if you've got somebody with really high norepinephrine, uh, again, that's probably something to, to look for and make sure that you're working to improve the inhibitory side of things so that that, that catecholamine surge can be decreased. And then the uh, American diet, right? Um, the glycemic dysfunction and, you know, Americans get on this uh, sugar roller coaster, right? They, um, you know, eat a, eat a bunch of sugar, a bunch of bread, rice, whatever, um, and blood sugar shoots up, insulin pours out. Uh, and then cortisol and epinephrine, you know, get the shakes and, you know, and we just ride that color roller coaster all the time, but it really can wreak havoc on our, on our system. And it, and it is, um, 
It was not a good thing, not a good thing. So um, psychosocial stress and well-being, um, well, psychological stress, uh, certainly from the literature we know, and you can check out these references we've got them for you. Yeah, it, yeah stress, as we know, affects mood um, negatively. Uh, we talked a little bit about glucose regulation, right, uh, which can in turn affect cardiovascular health and um, even respiratory health. And, and at the end of the day, um, because of a lot of these uh, metabolic conditions and so forth, can really affect our immunity and our cellular health and our cellular repair, repair um, through repairing our DNA and so forth. So um, yeah, these uh, psychological stress can really wreak havoc on, on a system. And, you know, we've talked a little bit about um, the adrenal cortex and um, adrenal health, but stress really affects thyroid as well. And it decreases the conversion um, of T4 to T3. It decreases thyroid hormone resistance um, at the cellular level, which is not something I think a lot of conventional um, endocrinologists really believe. But I mean, we, I think in functional medicine, we see it all the time. Um, so what can we do on the cellular level to improve things, right? Um, and then, you know, stress certainly causes hormonal imbalances and, and shuts down reproduction um, and decreases um, sex hormones. It certainly decreases testosterone, um, decreases DHEA, um, through mechanisms like uh, pregnenolone steel, you know, progesterone decreases in women, and we get a relative increase in uh, estrogen and estrogen dominance, right? So, yeah, uh, again, stress kind of wreaks havoc on the whole system. <laughs> in terms of GI health, and, and again, in functional medicine, we know how important this really is for us. Um, and I think in terms of stress and GI health, it, it really depends on the length of time we're talking about um, of the stress. I mean, short-term stress, stress can certainly lead to um, appetite loss and cause digestion to slow down. And, that, and that's because cortisol actually causes a shunt, uh, shunting of blood from the um, stomach to the brain, to the um, large muscles and to the limbs so we can get ready for that fight or flight, right? Um, but longer term stress can lead to uh, other GI issues like constipation, diarrhea, um, indigestion, reflux, uh, cramping, sometimes those sort of things. Um, and absolutely, you know, we see here microbial balance and health really can affect our um, microbiome. Um, and animal studies have shown that um, stress can rapidly affect um, the gut's bacterial composition. And so that's another thing to kind of be thinking about. And as we think about the gut, we have to think about serotonin because about 95% of serotonin in our body is produced in the, um, in the gut, right? So um, certainly affects motility patterns and gastric emptying and, and secretions. Um, some of the more chronic GI issues that we were talking about uh, with the diarrhea and constipation and cramping and so forth um, have been linked to low serotonin. Um, and low serotonin has clearly been linked to IBS, both um, diarrhea predominant and, and, and constipation predominant, as well as the bloating and the uh, cramping. So, um, you know, we can support serotonin levels through things like, you know, giving supplements of 5-HTP. Uh, we can also give uh, probiotics. We can also encourage our patients to eat more fermented foods and those sorts of things and can do an awful lot of good. When we think about stress and glucose regulation, this is another just super, super important area. Um, uh, and we talked a little bit about it. So, right, so when the body's stressed, the, um, uh, the body prepares itself for that fight or flight, uh, just to make sure that we have enough sugar, glucose, um, to do either of those things, right? Uh, so again, cortisol rises, um, insulin falls, glucagon, um, uh, pours out of the liver, epinephrine rises, um, gluconeogenesis occurs, uh, glycogenolysis occurs um, as more sugar is released um, from the liver, right? Um, but again, that's kind of that acute stress, but over the long haul, um, this can lead to, you know, the higher levels of cortisol over a long period of time it can actually lead to, you know, weight distribution issues. I mean, we get more uh, central fat and more visceral fat, which is not good. Um, 
that certainly can affect our insulin sensitivity uh, and uh, at the end of the day, affect our endothelial health. And so um, with uh, increased inflammation and increased TNF alpha because of the weight distribution and obesity, uh, increased IL-6, uh, CRP, all those things. Um, and again, none of those things are, are at all good for us. So working with patients to help re um, reverse some of the things um, is really the heart of what we do. And, you know, the, the nervous system controls everything, right? Um, you know, literally the nervous system kind of guides you know, everything we do, say, and, and think. It controls our movement, our thought, our memory. Also regulates the autonomic nervous system, as you can see here with the sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system. Um, affects, you know, affecting breathing and heart rate and metabolic processes. <laughs> and you don't have to go, uh, don't have to spend much time in a uh, Alzheimer's ward to see that the uh, the brain is, is pretty vital to, to all these processes. Um, and, and again, most of those are under the control of neurotransmitters and hormones. Yeah. So again, kind of that money shot of why the HPA axis is so, so important to health. So let's, um, let's talk about anxiety for uh, a couple of minutes. Um, we've got three patients here. We'll kind of dig into these guys a little bit more. So patient one, um, you can see that the anxiety is probably related or certainly could be related to an imbalance between the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA and um, excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate right? And also norepinephrine um, is high there. Uh, DHEA is a little bit um, increased too. So for this patient, supporting GABA um, would be very, very helpful. And the other thing to keep in mind here is that remember, these neurotransmitters aren't just neurotransmitters. They are neuromodulators, right? So remember that on that glutamate um, cell body, there are GABA receptors, right? And so uh, if you do not have enough GABA to, to hit those receptors, your glutamate uh, nerve cell is going to be shooting out um, these stimuli a, a, a lot faster. If you have adequate inhibitory uh, neurotransmitters, like adequate GABA to, to fill those receptors, your glutamate um, action potentials are going to be typically much slower. So let's look at um, uh, patient number two. Here we see elevated um, catecholamines. We see three out of four of their cortisol levels are high, particularly that evening one, uh, which can be bad too, because we, we know about this reverse diurnal pattern of being lower in the morning and higher at night, being associated with all cause mortality, right? Uh, not, not, a, not a good thing at all. Um, so for this patient, really uh, addressing the inhibitory side to kind of balance out the catecholamines and supporting the adrenals with some calming um, uh, adrenal support, along with um, things like you know, contemplative walking or meditation or biofeedback and all the other things we can do with our patients to, to get the, the adrenals back into to shape a little bit. Patient three, you know, there you look across and, and just about everything is, is, is low, right? Their calming neurotransmitters are um, depleted and this patient's uh, cortisol levels are low. Um, if you if you believe in adrenal fatigue or at least uh, you know adrenal insufficiency here, uh, this patient needs uh, calming neurotransmitter support, 5-HTP, GABA agonist, and that sort of thing, uh, and then um, also the adrenal support. So, um, and this is something that I've just noticed through the years. I, I can't back it up with any um, uh, literature, or I, I can't cite any literature about it, but. When I see a patient that's got just kind of depleted across the board, three things come to mind for me, or, th or at least three areas of questioning that I want to go down with the patient. One is traumatic brain injury. Uh, and I don't know, again, not sure why that is, but it's just something I've noticed. Um, the second thing is toxicity, either heavy metal toxicity or um, environmental toxicity. Um, and you'll just see this 
depleted levels across the board. And then the third thing is, you know, the guy that didn't miss anything from the 70s, right? <laughs> so, you know, substance abuse uh, can be uh, problematic uh, in, in whenever you see levels across the board being, being low, all right? Fourth, that's worth. So uh, again, we'll say neuroendocrine health is the key, really is the key to quality of life. And really a lot of these clinical complaints begin when we start to see imbalances uh, in these neurotransmitters and, and hormones. And here you can see, again, some of the relationships. And this is a really fun thing to, to learn. Uh, you know, uh, you can see some of the relationships between the hormones and the neurotransmitters. And there are also, you know, show you slides on uh, relationships between neurotransmitters and, and hormones. But trying again to, to figure out what these imbalances are and working with the patient to rebalance those things. I, I, I just really believe that you'll help more people get better faster than again, just about any other kind of intervention um, and therapy that you can, that you can do. So clinical association between the biomarkers, you can kind of look at this, but I, you know, I think, I think the bottom line here is that um, all of these neurotransmitters, um, really do cut across a wide swath of clinical conditions. Um, and, and it can be extremely helpful in figuring out those underlying causes of the imbalances and, and really helping the uh, patient uh, lead them out of these symptoms back into, back into wellness, which is really kind of fun. Um, so we have a lot of different profiles at Sinesco, um, different combinations of neuro uh, endocrine markers, but these two are probably our most uh, common and most popular ones. Um, so the HPA is uh, the seven neurotransmitters I mentioned and a uh, uh, two adrenal uh, hormone uh, as well. So a four point cortisol and a two point DHEA. And then we have the HPA G complete, which, um, you know, we recommend for folks over 30 years old, 40 years old, who are having hormonally uh, related complaints. Um, and um, certainly very helpful for folks like uh, that have PCOS or PMS. And again, those uh, perimenopausal women who we love so much because they um, fill up so much of our, we, we don't do menopause well in this country, I don't think. <laughs> so uh, those ladies need a lot of, a lot of support. And I'm, and I'm glad we have functional medicine to help. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the validity of, of neurotransmitters. And uh, yeah, a couple of years back, I, I wrote um, a paper, I think probably 130 references from the medical literature um, that we looked into urinary neurotransmitter validity. Um, and what you find is there are really a lot of uh, articles dealing with one or two or three uh, neurotransmitters having to do with different clinical conditions, whether that's, you know, migraines or again, uh, PMS or, or, or whatever. Um, what you won't find are uh, a lot of articles looking at profiles like the one we have um, and, and looking at that over time, you know, again, looking at, uh, at a, a whole model of care uh, that we call the CSM model or the communication system management model. Um, so, uh, Anyway, so I'll be showing you a little bit of data, internal data, um, self-reported data from, from about 20,000 patients, but it's, it's actually uh, very interesting. We'll take a look at that in, in a few minutes. Um, but again, there's been a long history of measuring neurotransmitters, um, and that's been done in blood and CSF and urine and saliva and the platelets uh, and the vitreous humor sometimes, but the urinary neurotransmitters do positively correlate with neurotransmitters in, this, in the central nervous system. Um, and, and there've been a number of studies, both animal and human, um, that show neurotransmitters in the blood and urine do correlate with neurotransmitters in the, in the spinal fluid. Not a lot of uh, recent studies, because a lot of, certainly my patients would not um, be up for the whole uh, you know, spinal tap thing to figure out what's going on. But we do have lots and lots of studies in these little Sprague Dolly rats you know, and we, you know, put the little rat NG tube and force feed them 5-HTP, for instance. Um, and then we'll can look at their CSF, their uh, blood, their urine, their peritoneal fluid. And there's this nice rise in serotonin over a couple of hours. And it's, it's really across the board. Um, 
And so those types of, of studies are the ones that you know we've really looked at, but it's, it's interesting stuff. As we think about the blood-brain barrier uh, here, um, you know, there are efflux transporters and serotonin transporters and uh, all kinds of ways, a uh, number of mechanisms to get neurotransmitters across the blood brain barrier um, and vice versa. Some neurotransmitters are certainly better at that than others. GABA, not very good at crossing the blood brain barrier. If you've ever tried to use just plain GABA. So we do end up using you know, a lot more GABA agonists to support the GABA that is there. Um, I, I do think that uh, I think the Japanese came up with uh, pharma GABA, and I have had better luck with that. Um, but yeah, and, and the other thing you have to remember as we're talking about metabolism of neurotransmitters is that the, the kidneys can really produce and metabolize really all of the, the neurotransmitters. And you go, well, yeah, but you're looking at urine neurotransmitter levels. Um, and I don't think that takes away at all from the validity of, of, of what we're doing. Um, again, start using this with patients and you really begin to see um, how important uh, looking into these things can be. And this is just one little slide from the um, monograph. We have a couple of monographs that we did on a cohort of around 20,000 patients. Um, of that cohort, uh, we, you know, there's a little over 700 folks who actually did three cycles of the CSM model using our uh, supplements that improve the neurotransmitter levels. And this is some of the results that we got. Um, and so this, again, these were self-reported uh, symptoms uh, based on a four point Likert scale, right? But as you can see, um, even given those detractions, I mean, pretty darn significant improvement in so many of the very, very common things that we see walking through the door, whether that's low mood or poor sleep or fatigue or uh, poor focus or PMS or any, you know, it's, uh, I, I can honestly say that what we're seeing here, and I, and I think for those of us that have been doing this type of work for a while, um, uh, you know, would say that this is as good or better than any pharmaceutical model we've, we've, we've ever used. Um, and I, I just found that to be true. So, and listen, be happy to send you the monographs and um, the in, this information, uh, uh, the studies that we did on this and uh, be happy to get your uh, input and feedback on that too. Just let, uh, uh, let us know at the end or yeah, be happy to do that for you. So um, what, other ways can we look at neurotransmitters? Well, one way is to look at neurotransmitter metabolite testing. And, and again, I'm, I'm not here to, to diss anything. I think as a matter of fact, there's validity to all of the, the things that we're talking about. And, and most of the ways to, to measure neurotransmitters, again, there's some validity to it. I mean, I think kind of take our favorites, uh, certainly. But, you know, neuro, neurotransmitter metabolites have been used for years uh, when we're looking at things like uh, pheochromocytoma or whatnot with the 5-HIAA and uh, VMA and HBA and those sort of things. But metabolite testing does just show you the inactive neurotransmitter byproducts. Um, really doesn't indicate the, um, it's kind of an indirect uh, look at neurotransmitter levels, but it's not a direct look. And I've always thought it made sense to me to look at the, the direct levels. And again, that's not to say that looking at the metabolites is worthless. It's not. It's It's can be very, very helpful. Um, and particularly when you're looking at things like genetic SNPs and whatnot, and we're just seeing how, how the, the neurotransmitters are being metabolized it can be um, actually quite helpful. Or if you're looking at potential, you know, cofactors, vitamins, those sorts of things. Um, so another way to look at this is through organic acid testing. And um, organic acid testing, and, and we did an awful lot of this when I was medical director at Great Smokies. Um, you know, so it can give you insight into neurotransmitter synthesis and, and oxidative stress, as well as looking at your different cofactors and vitamins and those sort of things that, that you see. Uh, and then, you know, that, that we know that vitamins certainly can impact neurotransmitter synthesis, but again, organic acids, not that helpful usually in looking at neurotransmitters themselves. Um, so I think 
that is um, all I have to share with you at this point. We're going to move on to uh, Nathan and let him share with you some some case studies and uh, talk to you about the care package add-on. So Nathan, you want to take it away? Thank you guys. Really appreciate your attention. Hope Absolutely. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Watkins. Um, thank you for all your great, your great insights there. Um, I want to uh, talk about uh, two things. I want to talk about our care package add-on um, that you guys can get through Rupa Health. Uh, to gain access to our comprehensive report, our clinical support um, team with all of the uh, resources that come along with that and the education, um, as well as wanna go over a really uh, fascinating case study um, as well at the end of the presentation. But first we're gonna dive into the CARE package and what that stands for is the Correlation Analysis Report and Education. And this is an add-on that you can get uh, through Rupa. It's not the standard um, thing that is offered through Rupa, but you can add it on um, and would highly recommend it and we'll, we'll see why. So Dr. Watkins, uh, next slide, please. So without the care package add-on, you get the standard lab results, which are great. I mean, it's definitely the most important thing that we offer at Sinesco is the window into the patient's neuroendocrine systems. But what it doesn't contain is the correlation, the connection between the patient's symptoms and the lab values, the education, where we talk about how the neurotransmitters are influencing mood and different quality of life issues, um, as well as the clinical insights that we put on there too, the custom commentary, as well as, and this is a big piece, customized therapeutic recommendations for healthcare providers to of course consider for their patients. Next slide, please. Yeah, this poor, this poor chap here has got some low serotonin. <laughs> Why, why we're waiting. Um, yeah. Uh, so the care package add-on, what it includes is uh, basically four main things. You're going to get a uh, patient quality of life questionnaire that patients fill out. You, you're going to get information and we get this information too, to customize your reports. Um, we're going to get information like their age, their weight, their cycling status, um, medication, supplements, symptoms that they're experiencing, caffeine use, um, any relevant medical history that we take into consideration when generating these uh, very comprehensive correlation analysis reports. Um, so I think the care package is really worth it too, because it's something that, you know, you can, you can share with your patients that they can, you know, if they're even a little bit, um, you know, scientifically minded, and there's a lot of citizen scientists today who are, rightly so, taking charge of their own health when, you know, standard medical models, and not all the time, but in a lot of cases have, have seemed to have failed those patients. Um, it can be really empowering for those patients to learn about their imbalances um, and to, you know, kind of partner with you on this journey to, to restore uh, optimal health and well-being. So obviously you'll get the NeuroLab test results as well. We do the personalized correlation analysis and education, really big uh, component of this. And then the targeted nutritional therapy recommendations. And these are tailored for each and every single patient. These are not computer generated by some algorithm. These are actually being hand selected by members of the clinical support team who are taking things into consideration, not just the lab values, you know, so it's not like, oh, you automatically are gonna get serotonin support as a recommendation if they have low serotonin. We take many other factors into consideration like medications that they're on, how many medications, um, weight, age, symptoms, you know, if someone has really, really bad uh, anxiousness and their dopamine, you know, it's a little questionable, but maybe they have high norepinephrine, you know, you wouldn't necessarily want to support that dopamine right out of the gate. Obviously there's other variables, but you get what I'm saying. You could, it's not just, you have to take the whole patient uh, into consideration. That includes the lab values when, when administering these therapeutics, which, you know, they are uh, nutritional, but they elicit a physiological response. And we've certainly seen that uh, not only in case studies, but also in our statistical analyses that we've um, had the opportunity to do. 
So let's see what we have next here coming up. So this is a overview of kind of how we make these correlations within the uh, care package. Um, so like, you know, you have all of these biomarkers, which can be associated with all these different uh, quality of life issues or symptoms. And, you know, any number of support might be beneficial depending on, you know, where the issues lie. So this is just an example. You know, a patient may have uh, an issue with GABA. They may have suboptimal or deficient levels of GABA, and then they are experiencing anxiousness, which would help us draw that connection between those two biomarkers and then make a really strong uh, case for some serotonin support. So that is done for you in these reports. Let's see what we have coming up on the next slide. Yeah, so something that's available with the care package add-on if you choose to do it um, is the targeted nutritional therapy formulas that we have, these were designed um, when we first got started as a company, because at the time there just really wasn't a whole lot on the market that helped to address neurotransmitter imbalance from a nutritional and natural standpoint. Of course, now, you know, there's lots of different neurotransmitter support uh, supplements out there, which I think, hey, you know, great for the population as a whole. Um, it does give me a little bit concerned that, you know, a lot of these things are available, you know, um, on the, uh, you know, health food store shelf. Um, you know, hopefully these patients are consulted, consulting with their healthcare providers because these really do uh, impact neurotransmitters um, in hormones. So um, really proud of our targeting nutritional therapy formulas. We only have a select few for very specific imbalances. So we're not, you know, this huge supplement company that has a supplement for, you know, every single thing under the sun, but these are very targeted formulas to address specific neurotransmitter and hormone imbalances. And we've seen that statistically speaking, they have an impact on quality of life concerns, which you know is great to be able to practice evidence-based medicine. And no, it's not a double-blind, crossover-controlled placebo study, um, but it's uh, it's really good with the with the with the amount of uh, participants that we're using in these in these studies. It it's some strong evidence. Um, plus, the only people who can afford uh, or at least I'm aware of double blind crossover control placebo studies or the pharmaceutical industry. And yeah, that's a whole, that's a whole nother uh, presentation. Um, so talking a little, just very quickly about some of the uh, target nutritional therapy formulas that we have, they are uh, manufactured at a manufacturing facility with current good manufacturing practices. So we are CGMP and all the formulas are free of gluten. They're non GMO. They're free of hydrogenated, fats and oils, and they're free of a lot of those common allergens like peanuts, wheat, soy, shellfish, artificial preservatives, sugars, so none of the bad stuff. Next slide, please. So this is an example of the information that is um, gleaned from the patient questionnaire that you get with the care package add-on. So you'll get some general information, you know, age, weight, uh, cycling status, you know, lifestyle um, issues and, you know, diseases as well, they can indicate on there. And we also get their um, medications and supplements as well as their symptoms. It's on a four point Likert scale, one being um, very mild and four being profound, kind of the, the most severe it can be. Let's see what we have coming up here on the next slide. All right, so this is um, just kind of an image on some of the connections that we make within the report itself, um, talking about really uh, correlating the patient's symptoms to the lab values. Here's just a kind of image to give you an idea of how many connections there can be. And you get this, um, you get these connections with the care package add-on. And last but certainly not least for the care package add-on, like I was saying, you get these personalized targeted nutritional therapy recommendations at the end of the report. Obviously, uh, ultimately, uh, you guys as the practitioners are the authority on what your patient gets. These are for you to consider. Um, and they're very personalized and very tailored, like I said, using um, the patient's um, history that we get, symptoms, medications, their, their neurotransmitter and hormone levels. So they're, they're very uh, tailored. And then it's really important to retest, you know, just like any other biological assessment 
that is done. And this is a care package, um, you know, benefit as well as you get to see, you know, side by side, uh, the current and previous values for your patient. So you can monitor their progress and if any adjustment uh, needs to be made. Um, but retesting is, is super important because, you know, just like any other biological assessment, you know, like thyroid, or like once you discover that there's a thyroid issue and if any type of therapy for thyroid is started, like, of course, you know, retesting is, is going to occur. So it's really important um, how, you know, to, to monitor how the therapies are impacting this system. So any adjustments can be made um, because, you know, and it's not even the influences that the therapies have on the particular neurotransmitters, but these neurotransmitters and hormones all interact with one another. So it's really key to see, you know, it's, it's a very delicate balance. So getting the dosages and getting the formulas and the appropriate formulas, so much can be gleaned from the retest. I think that's the most important test is once you challenge that, um, that axis in the neuroendocrine system with the therapeutics, then you really get to see what's going on with the patient. All right, so now we get to a really interesting uh, case study to break down a little bit, kind of get into a little bit of meat here uh, with you guys. So this particular patient um, I found, I thought it was a pretty interesting case. Um, this was a 42-year-old uh, female um, with hypothyroidism receiving treatment uh, for the hypothyroidism. Main complaints were anxiousness, fatigue, has some depression, uh, some weight gain, headaches, and some uh, vasomotor symptoms with some night sweats and, and some um, possible signs of hypoglycemia. Uh, the patient uh, was taking venlafaxine um, as well as some various uh, supplements. And when I saw this patient's uh, test results, I was just like, wow, <laughs> would have never known that had we not tested. So I just think it really speaks to the importance of why it's important to test the neuroendocrine system and the neurotransmitters is because there can be, if you don't test, you don't know because these symptoms are, they're non-specific. I mean, anxiousness could be due to any number of things or fatigue. So I think, you know, I'm a huge proponent of testing and not just the neurotransmitters and adrenal hormones, but thyroid and the gut. I mean, the more testing that can be done, I think the better, obviously you have to do what's appropriate for your patient, but man, it's just, Speaking from experience too, it is just, it can be life-changing. So bam, here's the, uh, here's this patient, it's test results. And I was like, wow, me, man, there is a, a lot happening here. Um, serotonin is just like hanging in there and the patient's on uh, an SNRI. Um, Norepinephrine is barely hanging in there too. So that, that whew, it just shows like, you know, and this particular patient had been on antidepressants for like 10 years. So it's like, golly, you know, and I can get into a whole conversation about how, you know, SSRIs and different psychotropic medications can influence neurotransmitters. But in, in a nutshell, basically what I've observed is a, um, there seems to be a relationship between duration of use of some of these different psychotropic substances like SSRIs and level of neurotransmitter. So occasionally you'll catch, you know, patients who have just started some type of um, mood altering pharmaceutical, but you know, those, those cases are a lot more rare as you guys probably know, because you know, in integrative functional medicine, a lot of those patients have already tried the standard medical approach. So it's kind of rare to see those patients who have just started some type of psychotropic therapy, but in the ones that we do see, man, the, the neurotransmitters are, are going off. So, you know, if you catch a patient who's been on an SSRI for, you know, what is it, the two to three week, four week onset period, you know, you'll, you'll see, you know, a lot of times an optimal or even a high serotonin level, but you can take patients who have been on SSRIs for 10 years and their serotonin levels are just absolutely in the basement. And I've seen, you know, you know, other medications like amphetamines, like Adderall, you know, dopamine, like some, uh, you know, ADHD uh, uh, individual, um, had just started taking amphetamine and their dopamine was like 3000 and like norepinephrine was like, norepinephrine was like a hundred, but then you can, you know, I see a lot of those patients just completely wiped, um, you know, who have been on those for any significant period of time. So anyway, seems to be a relationship between duration of use over time because I mean, yeah, the drugs work. Um, but it's like the mechanism of action is not necessarily to, uh, 
actually increase the biosynthesis of the particular neurotransmitter. So I, I kind of like to think of it as, you know, someone starting a road trip, you know, when they're on some of these psychotropic medications and they're never stopping for gas. Like eventually your car is just going to run out of gas. So anyway, that's a, that's another conversation, but yeah, let's uh, advance to the next slide and kind of get into some of the uh, nitty gritty here on some of these um, imbalances that we see, which I think are very interesting. Um, so this particular patient has a high glutamate and a high PEA. And some of the things that come to mind uh, with these imbalances is, you know, is there underlying inflammation? Because underlying inflammation can really drive up glutamate. There's evidence in the literature that suggests inflammatory cytokines can increase glutamate release. There's um, literature that talks about glutamate and inflammatory states being getting uh, diffused out of the synapse and causing issues. So if there's high glutamate, that's one of the things I'm always suspicious of is underlying inflammation. And with the high PEA, you know, one of the things, and I've actually encountered this quite a bit in talking with uh, healthcare providers on particular patient results is that aspartame consumption can be a real culprit when it comes to elevating PEA, which is phenethylamine. It's an, uh, one of your body's primary excitatory neurotransmitters. It's very similar in molecular structure and in function to something like synthetic stimulants. Obviously, it's, it's not the same thing. Uh, PEA is uh, degraded by monoamine oxidase B. Um, so yeah, but there are, there are some similarities between things like synthetic amphetamine and your body's uh, production of, of uh, PEA. So the aspartame uh, content um, in things like diet sodas, sugar-free energy drinks, which is rampant, you know, people are reaching for those, you know, they're hitting the convenience store on their way to work and picking up the, the healthier choice uh, with, the, with the energy drinks. Um, and man, those things, a lot of those things are just loaded with aspartame. Um, and it can, aspartame contains, so it's aspartic acid, which is a precursor to glutamate. So it can increase glutamate too, uh, aspartame, but also it contains um, the synthetic form of phenylalanine, D-phenylalanine, which is a precursor to PEA. So it can just readily get converted into PEA and you're all wired and you can't sleep and you're anxious and you're worried and you're wondering why and bam, you know, you run this test and sure enough, it comes to light. So I think it's really uh, important to check for diet. Um, and also with the glutamate um, is monosodium glutamate, you know, so that's another dietary influence that can occur on, on glutamate. I um, mean, that's, you know, in tons of junk food. I mean, if it tastes too good to be true, you know, <laughs> it probably has a uh, uh, monosodium glutamate MSG. Um, so another, uh, interesting, um, imbalance here is the very low, I mean, this GABA is like deficient. Um, not only does it fall below optimal range, but it falls below reference range. I mean, this is, this is really sucking wind, um, and this high glutamate. So one of the things you can ask, well, obviously, you know, if you get low GABA, um, which could be depleted from stress, um, really takes a toll on that. Um, alcohol consumption too, over a long period of time, uh, alcohol really targets the GABA system as well as, you know, a lot of other different systems, serotonin, dopamine, cortisol. Um, but, uh, you know, so obviously, so supporting GABA is important here to, you know, try to restore the balance between the yin and the yang for these neurotransmitters. Um, but also one of the things that could be occurring with an imbalance like this is maybe they have uh, issues with the glutamate decarboxylase enzyme, or they could have a B6 deficiency since that's necessary for that conversion. So that's something that comes to mind when you see this, such a severe imbalance between the glutamate and the GABA. Another interesting uh, kind of pattern here to consider, um, and this is not, by no means is this diagnostic, you know, this is a, this is a functional test, but these are certainly insights that can be can be gleaned. And man, when you pair this with the patient's concerns, it really can, can uh, lead to incredible health outcomes. And that's certainly what we've seen. Um, so the very low, I mean, this dopamine, it's like the GABA is uh, sucking wind very, very much. Um, and when you get this high uh, PEA and a very low dopamine, one of the things that pops into my mind is, do they have a decreased phenylalanine hydroxylase activity? And this is the enzyme that converts phenylalanine into tyrosine and then on down to um, L-dopa and your, your catecholamine neurotransmitters. Um, you know, classically, when you have a total shutdown, 
of the phenylalanine hydroxylase enzyme, you know, that is known even in, you know, mainstream medicine, that's PKU. And that's, you know, generally uh, diagnosed at birth. But I've heard practitioners describe PKU as, you know, kind of a spectrum. Um, you know, the, there may be varying levels of how that phenylalanine hydroxylase enzyme is um, working. So when you see this really low dopamine uh, in a very high PEA, that's one of the things that possibly might be happening because it's not shown here on this little um, pathway, but uh, the phenylalanine um, can get converted over into PEA via the aromatic amino acid decarboxylase enzyme, the AADC. Um, so when you have phenylalanine not converting the tyrosine, you've got more phenylalanine building up and where does it go? It goes to PEA. Um, and a necessary, a necessary cofactor too for um, phenylalanine hydroxylase is, is a BH4 tetrahydrobiopterin. And that's involved in methylation processes. So you, you see on the left, you have your methionine homocysteine cycles um, connected to your, uh, your folate cycle and then your biopterin cycle. Um, so you need adequate methylation uh, to produce neurotransmitters. Um, it's super, super important. That's why you make sure you have adequate methyl donors for those who are uh, under methylating and your methylated B vitamins for those folks who need it. Um, so, some other uh, insights here on this particular case, you know, they have a high DHEA. Could it be acute stress? Um, that can certainly raise DHEAS. You can see it in the literature. Um, you know, and they're also on thyroid medications. And you can see in the literature, it's pretty cool. Um, studies that show that hyperthyroid patients typically run um, a little bit higher on, excuse me, on the DHEAS. And it would stand to reason that possibly thyroid medication, if the dose, maybe it's too high, you know, might be increasing uh, the DHEAS. Um, so we have this, you know, low cortisol and epinephrine pattern, you know, certainly could be prolonged stress that can deplete most of your neurotransmitters, um, especially your, your stress response ones. Um, and then with the, uh, with the, like Dr. Watkins was talking about with your you know, how cortisol and epinephrine influence blood sugar regulation with gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis. Um, that's something else too to consider is, you know, how, how good at, are they at managing their, their, their blood sugar? Um, so then, uh, so for this, for this particular, okay, yeah, so the patient had been on the SNRI for 10 years. Uh, that certainly may be a possible factor in this low serotonin and norepinephrine. Sadly, if the patient were off this drug, like and not taking any other support, uh, we'd actually probably be seeing, uh, if the patient just stopped cold turkey, we'd probably even see a lower serotonin and norepinephrine level. I wanna say, you know, with the drug on board, the drugs that target the neurotransmitters, typically about 30 to 40% higher uh, when those drugs are on board and they'd be lower if those drugs were off. So, you know, when you see low neurotransmitters on someone who is on drugs to support that neurotransmitter, that's a, that's a problem. Um, so for this particular patient, you know, these were things that for the healthcare provider uh, to consider, which is prolent for the serotonin, Lintra uh, for the GABA, Contegra, catecholamines, and then adaptogen for those uh, poor um, cortisol levels. Um, and this is all available. These recommendations are all available uh, when you get the care package add-on through RUPA. See, I think that does it for the case study. Yeah, so this is a, you know, a, a slide on kind of a take home message on the um, statistical analyses that we've done. We've had the opportunity to run about five different statistical analyses on different patient populations. Um, and basically what we found is in a nutshell, when patients test approximately three times over the course of about eight months, and during that time, practitioners are administering the targeted nutritional therapy recommendations, not only do we see statistically significant uh, improvements in the patient's um, biomarkers, so we actually see improvements in uh, things like serotonin, dopamine, et cetera, but we also see improved, statistically significant improvements in self-reported quality of life that we get on that questionnaire. And this is just an image of some of the studies that we've done. We'd be happy to send uh, any of those studies along. We won't go into those, uh, into this particular, in this particular presentation. So in summary, uh, 
and Dr. Watkins, feel free to bring it home with me too. Um, you know, stress is rampant and, uh, you know, assessing HPA access is critical and we need, you know, non-drug based approaches for practitioners to consider for their patients. Um, and the, and the care package add on is a really crucial piece to help you help you do that. Yeah, I think there's a lot of information there that is, uh, you know, very valuable, and it's particularly valuable for, for patients. And, you know, the information that, that you'll get can help you too for, you know, uh, yeah, I guess I would say it probably takes 30 to 50 tests to kind of under your belt to, to get a real comfort level with the recommendations and that sort of thing. But patients eat this stuff up. <laughs> they really do. I think we're heading over, yeah, to the uh, others, Anthony. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Watkins and Nathan. That was a really great presentation on the HPA axis. This is such an important topic, especially in today's world, as you mentioned. So thanks for giving everyone some further insight into this. So we do have some time now, and we did get some really great questions for our live Q&A. So let's dive right into that. So the first question is, how often do I need to retest my patients? Um, I, I'll take that one, I guess. Um, you know, we usually say uh, after we do the test, usually eight to 10 weeks, unless the patient uh, is on an SSRI or, or SNRI and who isn't. Um, but uh, usually eight to 10 weeks, a little bit quicker maybe if they are on medication. And then I typically the first year in working with a patient would probably do three or four tests. Uh, and then after that, you can use the test really as kind of a, a guidepost. Um, I, you know, I don't know about your patients, but mine don't continue to take everything I tell them to do forever. Um, but uh, so oftentimes they will have quit taking stuff if they, if they're doing well, and then they, you know, come back nine months later and say, you know, I don't feel too good again. Well, are you still taking the stuff we talked about? No. Um, and so it kind of gives you a guidepost where to, where to start back and allows you then to, to move forward from there. But yeah. Um, how often the first retest usually eight to 10 weeks um, sooner if they're on medications or if they're more medically complicated. Okay. Thank you so much for that answer. Moving on to question number two, how long should someone be on supplements before retesting? Nate, you want to go on? Yeah, yeah. So generally, um, you know, we recommend um, a period of about um, eight to 10 weeks. Like Dr. Watkins was saying, um, if the patient is on some type of mood altering pharmaceutical, um, or pharmaceutical that may have any potential interactions with any amino acid type therapies uh, would typically want to retest those patients a little bit sooner. But you can see changes um, in the neurotransmitters as soon as, you know, six weeks. So, And you can get effects, I would say, even sooner than yeah. that. Somebody that's anxious, you pop a Lintra or one Lintra twice a day and they're feeling better. Reason being, it, it, it's not that their GABA levels go up that quickly, um, but, you know, uh, Lintra is something that contains something called lactium, which is a, kind of a modified milk peptide that's uh, from Switzerland. Um, very, very well studied in peer-reviewed literature. And it's also got quite a bit of theanine in it. So just those two things, uh, plus the other, you know, GABA agonists in there can really give some relief very, very quickly if, if patients are, act, are anxious. And, and I would also say Lintra is one of those things that, um, you know, if, if, if you run out of it or if it gets back ordered or, um, you know, for some reason you can't get it, it, it's the thing that patients will wrap around your building saying, hey, where's my Lintra? Um, so it's good stuff. I think we can all relate to that, Dr. Walker. So thank <laughs> yeah. you. Next question is, how long does it take to see improvements when patients are started on the nutritional supplement formulas? Oh, yeah, I guess that's kind of what I just, just said. So um, typically within a couple of weeks, usually, if it's a depression type of a thing, anxiety, again, can be actually quite 
quick. Uh, same thing with, um, with sleep issues, I think can be quicker. Um, you know, a couple, um, uh, a couple of, of days on something like a Somni TR, which is a truly extended release melatonin. And people get really bad dreams a lot of time if you start like a, a, an immediate release uh, melatonin. But Somni is a really good formula that has a, a true eight hour um, melatonin plus theanine and a couple of other things in it. So, um, yeah, pretty, pretty quick. Perfect. Perfect. Next question is, can I test my pediatric patients? Yes, absolutely. We have, um, we do have age adjusted ranges for the neurotransmitters, um, for the adrenal hormones. Um, anyone who is, um, 12 or younger, we don't have pediatric ranges for the adrenal hormones, but for the neurotransmitters, we do have, um, age adjusted ranges as low as five years old. So yes, you can certainly and test in pediatrics. Yeah. And we're continually revamping those as time goes on as, as any lab should be. Perfect. Perfect. We have one last question here for time purposes. And that is, can you talk a little bit about time restricted eating and how it impacts, um, the hormones on the tests. Yeah. Dr. Watkins, I mean, we can, we can joint, we can joint this. Yeah. Yeah, you go ahead. Uh, but I mean, yeah, I would imagine it would. I mean, because when you typically, when you're in a hypoglycemic state, um, you know, your body can perceive that as a stress response and, you know, your body will secrete more cortisol and norepinephrine and epinephrine. Um, in an attempt to help stabilize blood sugar, you know, going to those glycogen stores and helping your body uh, make its own glucose through gluconeogenesis. So, and, you know, and the, and the effect that, you know, your, um, stress hormones can have on your sex hormones and yeah, sure. Absolutely. I think, um, time restricted eating could certainly influence the results to what extent, you know, would vary from individual, but certainly I think it's possible. Yeah. And I, and I, w- I would agree and, and would say certainly the, Adrenals would be much more potentially affected um, and say sex hormones would be. But, yeah. That all makes sense. We had a few other questions come in today. So if we weren't able to get to yours, we will be sure to follow up. But thank you so much, everyone, for attending the live class today. That's all the time we have. Big shout out to Dr. Watkins and Nathan from Sinesco. You guys did an amazing job. And we thank all you. hope to see you on the next one. So thanks again.